Alrighty, we have started the senses. This is our second video about the senses. Um, we've already learned that our experiences of sensation, whether it's taste or touch or smell or temperature, we owe that experience to very highly modified nerve cells that are called sensory receptor cells. Sensory receptor cells fall into a number of different categories. Uh, let's just uh, start off with the basics. You know, theor on a theoretical level, any form of energy that's in the universe is something theoretically that an organism would be able to sense as long as they had a nerve cell that was modified specifically to um, transduce that particular energy. Right? Um, transducing energy is taking the energy from one form, like the form of a chemical, <clears throat> and turning it into a different form, like the form of an action potential. I have got a real simple animation here that shows a, uh, a receptor cell that's here in pink with a red nucleus. These blue kind of uh, triangles on the surface of that receptor cell, in this case, <clears throat> are going to be receptors for a chemical. And in this case, it's going to be a chemical that people could taste, right? Um, uh, whatever that chemical is, let's call it PTC, um, is going to be represented here by these yellow triangles. If those yellow triangles, that PTC is in my saliva, then if they come in contact with and bind to the receptor proteins on the surface of my receptor cell, like this, then that receptor cell is going to have an action potential. When the action potential arrives in a certain part of my brain, my brain will perceive that as being the flavor of whatever that chemical is. So that's basically the way a sensory receptor cell works. I want you guys to know that there are three main categories of sensory receptor cells for our special senses, and then two extra categories that I want you to know. The first category are the mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors can detect a mechanical force. What's a mechanical force? A mechanical force would be like being pressed or being stretched or being bent, okay? Those would be the mechanical forces. Chemoreceptors, they are modified to detect the presence of specific chemicals. Chemoreceptor cells work the way my last animation would have just shown you that it works. Um, and our chemoreceptors allow us to detect tiny molecules and we describe those chemicals as things that we can taste or smell. Then we have got photoreceptors. And photoreceptors allow us to sense light, photons of light. So those are our big three, okay? Mechanoreceptors, chemoreceptors, photoreceptors. There are a couple others that I'd like you to know. I'd like you to know that we have thermoreceptors. The thermoreceptors in humans are not all the same. Uh, they're all thermoreceptors because all of them allow us to detect temperature, but some of them, like the thermoreceptors in our skin, they allow us to detect a difference in temperature between our skin and whatever is touching it. But there are other thermoreceptors, like deep in the brain, that allow us to detect a true temperature. And then we've got this category the nociceptors, nociceptors. Nociception is the experience of physical body pain. And nociceptors are highly modified nerve cells that allow you to experience pain. Uh, I particularly want you to know about nociceptors because nociception and getting better medications to control pain in humans is a very important uh, field of research. Now, I'd like you to notice that mechanoreceptor is bright yellow. 
Humans have got two mechanoreceptor senses, and they are also written in yellow on the next slide. So our mechanoreceptor cells, they're written here in yellow because the mechanoreceptor senses on the next slide are written in yellow. Chemoreceptor cells in peach, chemoreceptor senses in peach on the next slide, and photoreceptor cells in blue on the next slide. So here are the five human special senses. Our, our senses of touch and hearing, as well as balance, we can do that because of special mechanoreceptor cells, cells that respond to being stretched or bent or, or pressed. Um, our sense of taste and olfaction, these are chemoreceptor senses, and uh, they uh, are because we can experience chemicals. And vision, our last sense, this is our photoreceptor sense. Let's very briefly talk about our sense of touch. The sense of touch is more complicated than you would imagine. Um, uh, the image here on our slide is showing you an artist's rendering of the skin. The skin has got three layers. Uh, the surface layer, which is just right here, is called the epidermis. The next layer is called the dermis, and the lowest layer is called the hypodermis or subcutaneous region. And almost all of your sensory receptor cells of touch and temperature are found in this middle region called the dermis. Now, actually the different kinds of sensory receptor cells that are here in the dermis, they're actually very specific. Some of you, them allow us to detect like a very a very faint touch like um, the a cat, uh, like um, something really delicate going along the surface of your skin. Some of them are better for very firm touches, and we're not going to go into that kind of detail. What I want you to know is that our sense of touch relies on mechanoreceptor cells that will fire off an action potential when they are pressed or bent or stretched. Mechanoreceptors also give us our sense of hearing and our sense of balance. Your sense of hearing, well, you know what that is, but also your sense of balance, knowing up and down, knowing whether your body is spinning or whether you're accelerating in space, those things are, are all jobs that your ear does. Uh, all of the mechanoreceptor cells that allow us to experience hearing and balance are all found here in the inner ear. Okay. Um, you will have learned the parts of the ear in lab. The outer ear is going to be the cochlea or pinna and the auditory canal, and that just grabs sound and channels it down into where that sound will run into the tympanum. The tympanum is the boundary between the outer ear and the middle ear. The tympanum doesn't have any mechanoreceptor cells and neither does the middle ear. The middle ear has got those three little bones, the ossicles, and their job is to take the vibration of the tympanum and magnify that. And also, right here where the stapes comes in contact with the oval window, that is where uh, the, that mechanical force will be turned into a wave of liquid that will go through the cochlea of the inner ear. Here you can see just um, an enlargement of the middle ear and the inner ear. Now the middle ear has got those three bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, but I'm really focused here on the inner ear. The inner ear is actually inside of like a thick little chunk of bone that is part of your temporal bone. Um, and you can see here that we have got that little snail shell thing called the cochlea. It's in the cochlea that we will find the mechanoreceptors that allow you to experience sound. And here we will find the areas of the vestibule that give you your sense of up and down and acceleration. And this is representative right here 
those three semicircular canals, and they allow you to experience whether or not you are rotating somehow in space. If I were to, to look at it through a microscope at parts of the cochlea, I will find the exact mechanoreceptor cells that allow you to experience sound. These are super delicate cells. In this little biopsy specimen, these are healthy mechanoreceptor cells, and all of these, they've all died for some reason. The mechanoreceptor cells um, will fire off an action potential when they bend. Sound waves that have been turned into water waves inside of that snail shell thing, the cochlea, um, those sound waves will bend different ones of these cells. And when those cells bend, we will our brain will experience that as sound. Now, these cells right here, these are healthy. These are very sad cells. These are not working anymore, right? Um, and so this is my moment to warn you not to treat your ears the way my generation has treated ours. When you listen to sounds that are too loud constantly, then you will actually damage these cells and then they start to look like that. If you've ever gone to a really loud concert or nightclub and as you lay in bed later that night, you hear this buzzing sound, that buzzing sound is these guys here cursing you as they die. Now, luckily for us humans, uh, these cells can regrow themselves a, a number of times, but they can't keep regrowing themselves forever. So the more we expose our, our cochleas to very loud uh, sounds, uh, the more we are losing these particular uh, sound waves. And if I can find um, the test, I will post the hearing test for you up on um, Canvas. So you can check and see if there are some sounds that now you're already unable to hear. Actually, by the time you're 13 or 14 or 15, you've already lost the ability to hear some sounds. Ah, but that reminds me that this is probably going to be on the exam. Damage to the delicate hair cells is the number one cause of acquired deafness which is why in my household we're always saying, what did you just say? So the inner ear, the inner, the inner ear area that includes the cochlea, the semicircular canals and the vestibule, that does more than allow you to experience sound. It's more than hearing. It also is your sense of balance, right? And balance, your sense of up and down is right here in the vestibule, whereas your sense of whether or not you're rotating in space is uh, coming from these three guys, the semicircular canal. Uh, in each ear, we have got one semicircular canal that kind of rolls this way. That semicircular canal lets me know if I'm doing a somersault. Oh, a cartwheel. There's one that goes this way that lets me know if I'm doing a somersault, and one that goes this way that lets me know if I'm doing a pirouette. And your brain will take all three of them, add them all up, and decide how our body is rotating in space. Okay. I also wanted to mention something else. I wanted to mention this thing, uh, the uh, eustachian tube. The eustachian tube is also known as the auditory tube. And the auditory tube connects this pocket of air that has those ossicles in it with uh, the back of your throat. Whenever you go up to a high altitude, like let's imagine you're driving up to Big Bear, whenever you go up in a high altitude, periodically your ears pop, right? How's that happening? Well, there, the pop is not the sound of air going through the eardrum. The tympanum, it's a complete sheet. There's no air that goes across it. That pop that you get will be the buildup of pressure inside of here. Actually, it's a drop in pressure in the outside world. And then all of a sudden, a little bubble of air will whoop, go out through the eustachian tube and arrives back in the back of your throat. The reason that little kids can get such wicked bad ear infections just from a simple cold virus will be 
when the virus causes swelling of these membranes, just like your nose gets swollen and it, you get a runny nose, right? Well, this area gets swollen and it swells shut and that extra runny nose kind of fluid will build up also here in the middle ear. And so the pressure builds up, but there's no way for it to get out. And that causes quite a bit of pain. So don't forget the eustachian tube, also known as the auditory tube. I think it's got a